Okay, we're going to get started. Um, there seems to be some confusion about which room uh, you should be in for this session. Hopefully, everyone can can figure it out. I tried to make it clear that we have one room for office hours, one room for our virtual classroom meeting, and one room for an open meeting um, that you can use at any time. I know that some of you are trying to help others get into the session, and hopefully everyone will, will show up eventually. Um, I, I will try to make it clearer. I don't know, you know how much clearer I can make it. Um, hopefully everyone will be able to figure out where they should be. Okay, the date is what is confusing. What, what I've done is created three sessions that are available for the whole time. Um, the date is just when it's created. It's not necessarily the date of the session. These sessions will be there for the entire term. So uh, you'll always just go into the one that says virtual class meeting when we're having our required class meeting. You know, even though the date says February 2nd or something like that, you'll always come into this room or this session for your virtual class meeting. The same thing with office hours. Hopefully, um, everyone will get into the room, and I will send out another note today to try to make that clear. If someone can't get in or they're in a different room while we're having this session, um, they can always watch the recording. And I do, there are separate recordings for every day. You should be able to see them out there. And I do try to rename them too so that they'll have different names like week one um, virtual class session, week two virtual class session, and that should make it clear what the recordings are. Okay, I'm going to get started because we do have a lot that we need to cover today. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the textbook. This is the textbook that you should be using for the class. Okay, this is a textbook that some of you have but it does not match what we're using in the class. It's very similar, but it's not exactly the same. OK, hello to everyone who, who's joined. I can't greet you individually because we need to get started in the, in the actual uh, materials for this week. So some of you have let me know that you haven't been able. Oh, go ahead, Wari, if you have a question. Okay, hey, while I'm waiting for Warip to an enter her question, I want to ask you questions, and I want you to raise your hand. How many of you have access to this textbook, which is the correct textbook for the course? Please raise your hand. Use the little hand that you see. Okay.
Okay, the, the university has asked me um, to record who has the book and who hasn't been able to get it, so that's why it's taking me a minute to just record who has, who has raised their hand here. Uh, would you please keep your hand up until I let you know to, to put your hand down? Thank you. Okay, who has access to this version of the textbook? The one with the blue cover. Okay, put your hand down if you have the first book and put your hand up if you have the second book. Okay, so a few of you have the second book. How many of you have no textbook at all at this point? Put your hand down if you have a textbook. Put your hand up if you do not have a textbook. Okay, whether it's online or not, um, uh, I, it doesn't really matter to me whether you have the hard copy or not. I'm just trying to, to find out who has textbooks and who, who doesn't. Okay, so most of you have access to some textbook. Um, I see you've asked me a few questions here. Um, okay, this is the correct textbook for the course. What I've been told is that you need to purchase an access code in order to access that book from your Blackboard environment. Okay, I've been told this is the required textbook for the course. Okay, I know some people had had trouble actually accessing the bookstore to get that, that um, access code, hopefully that's getting resolved. Um, some of you are looking at where you can buy the hard copy, the actual physical book for the course. Um, I haven't seen this version of the book anywhere to purchase, um, at least not here in the United States. Okay, some of you have this book. If you have this book, it's um, Similar, but like I said, some of the exercises will be different, and some of the um, chapters actually will be different. So if you're looking at the weekly instruction, it's going to say do exercise 3.2. Um, it won't match exercise 3.2 in this book. It's exercise 3.2 for the correct textbook for the course. So it's recommended that you have the correct version of the textbook. Um, what I will try to do is when I know there are differences between the textbooks, I will, I will write that um, in a note or something so that you know if you if you haven't been able to access the correct textbook and you're still working with the one with the blue cover, I'll let you know where to find things in the, the book with the blue cover if I can. But I don't know I don't know all the differences between the two books. Okay, so it's really recommended that you get the one with the brown cover. And while you're waiting to get that, if you have the one with the blue cover, you could use it. If you have no textbook at all, I would advise that you get a textbook as soon as you can. If you have the correct version in a PDF, um, whether you buy it from the university or buy it someplace else, uh, that's correct. That's okay. I mean, as long as you have the book with the brown cover, you're, you're good. Okay? 
Sahar said the order of the chapters are going to be different. Yes, they are, as well as some of the exercises will be different. OK, so try to get a copy of the one with the brown cover. OK, is that clear to everybody? OK, then I'm going to move on from here. If you, if you ha don't have a textbook at this time and for some reason you're not able to get one, email me as soon as possible because you're going to start falling very behind in the course if you don't have a textbook. Remember that the majority of the information that's going to be on your exams will be from the textbook, even if you don't have an exercise that covers it or we don't talk about it in our virtual sessions, you're still responsible for what's in the textbook. And the textbook is the textbook with the brown cover. OK. I'd like to move on then to discuss how things went last week. OK, last week our only assignments were to post on the discussion boards. And I want to thank you for participa participating. Uh, we had very good participation on the discussion boards. I've talked to some other professors who are teaching this class at SEU where none of their students were participating on the discussion board or very few were. We had excellent participation on the discussion board and I want to thank you for that. In exercise one for week one, the biggest problem that I saw is that people were posting definitions that they found on the web or found on a book in a book. And the problem is it has to be in your own words. I can't give you credit for copying someone else's words and, and putting it as the answer. I know some of you are uncomfortable with your English. Um, I'll try to work with you on that. I'll do the best I can to understand what you're trying to say. And if I have questions, I will let you know. OK, the other part of it was to respond, and the important part here was that you had to add value. You are all very supportive of one another and helping each other. Um, and what, what I want you to do when you're doing your, your discussion postings is add value. In other words, saying that you like someone's definition or that it's very good is very nice but it doesn't add value to helping them learn more about operating systems, for example. So your responses are really to help the other person if they forgot to talk about something or if you could um, express it a different way that might help them understand. That's really what the responses are for, to help, help uh, one of your classmates or all of your classmates, since we could all read the postings, um, to learn more, OK? So, so after I graded the discussion boards, some of you were um, not happy with the grade you got. Others felt like you were happy with the grade you got, but you wanted to do more practicing with a discussion board. So I've created an optional discussion board exercise for week two. OK, you do not have to do this. It's only if you want to do this. So in this week's discussion, we're answering the question, how do processes and threads differ? In other words, how is a process different from a thread? And you can explain this again in your own words. There is a discussion board out there for you to use. And this explanation of how they differ, you should put out on the discussion board by Thursday, February 6th. Then, like last week, I want you to respond to at least one classmate's posting. And again, I want this posting to add value. And I'd like you to do this by the end of the day on Sunday. OK, so it's very similar to last week. We just have a different question that we're asking. The other thing you'll notice is I'm not going to be as active posting things in the discussion board during this week because I want you to help each other and ask each other questions rather than having me help you and ask you questions. I will be reading everything and, and um, I will give you feedback on how you're doing. So after you complete this assignment, 
I will go back through and grade your week two assignment, and I can use that to update your grade for week one. For example, if you did not do very well in week one, and you did better in week two, I will change your grade from week one to give you a better grade. OK? Any questions on that? You don't have to say no. Just say yes if you do have a question. OK. Now I'm going to talk about the other assignment that's due this week. The first thing that I, we talked about was optional. This is what's required for the week. You're going to have three exercises to do. They're exercise 3.2, 3.6, and 4.11 if you have the book with the brown cover on it. If you have the book with the blue cover on it, they're exercises 3.9, 3.13, and 4.16. I want you to submit your answer in a Word document. So if you look out on the weekly instruction, you'll see where there's week two exercises and there's a link for a submission. If you go into that link, you'll see where you can um, attach a Word document as your submission, you can write comments. There's a section there if you want to say something to me, explain something to me that's, that's not in your document. And then you will submit it. You will only be allowed to submit it once. So make sure you have everything you, you want in your Word document before you submit it. Label each answer with the exercise number. So in other words, put 3.2 and then give me your answer. Then say exercise 3.6 and give me your answer for that one. So I know that um, what question you are answering in the document. Try to answer each question as fully as you can. And make sure all your answers are your original work in your own words, OK? Any questions on the assignments for this week? OK. Let's move on. And if I see any questions pop up, I will try to answer them. OK, this slide is a slide that I had wanted to show you last week but I wasn't able to do so because we ran out of time. Basically, I like this picture because it gives you a good perspective on all the things that are going on in an operating system. Usually, when you interact with an operating system, you're using the user interfaces, OK? The GUI, the Windows. Sometimes you may use a command line. Um, but, but the operating system is responsible for displaying that UI and getting your responses from that UI. Some other services that the operating system provides are program execution. And so the system has to be able to load a program into memory and run that program. Um, and Eventually, it has to ensure that that program ends, whether it ends normally or abnormally, which would indicate there was an error in the program. The, the operating system is also responsible for input and output operations. So that might be um, writing to a file, um, you know, doing something with an I.O. device, like printing a document on, on the printer, and so forth. The operating system is also responsible for file system manipulation. Programs need to read and write files. You need to have directories. You have to be able to create files, delete files, search files, um, create directories, um, give different people permission to see your files or not see your files, and all that. All those things are services that the operating system provides. 
The operating system also provides for communication. Processes can exchange information on the same computer or between computers over a network. Uh, they, you can exchange information on the same computer doing things like memory sharing or through message passing. Um, you could also communicate over the network using TCP IP, and we talk about some of this in this week's session. In addition, the operating system is responsible for resource allocation. So when multiple uh, jobs or processes are running, the operating system has to keep track of who's using what memory so that you don't um, write over somebody else's memory or somebody else's program. We, you don't want the different programs on the system or the different processes on the system to interfere with one another. The operating system also performs accounting, and this helps you keep. This is when the operating system will keep track of what a process is using or what a user is using on the system. And like I said, we have to be concerned with um, protection and security. You want to the you want to have the operating system ensure that. All the access to the system resources is controlled and it's protected. You don't want everybody to be able to get into your computer and do whatever they want on it. And you also uh, want to make sure that um, you're, the, the system is being defended from attacks because people sometimes try to get into your computer and do things on purpose just to harm you or to steal your information. In addition, the operating system also has to provide error detection. The operating system is looking at errors in the CPU, looking for when there may be hardware errors, memory goes bad, uh, problems with I.O. devices, problems with user programs, and the operating system is monitor monitoring all this um, wh while you're using the computer or while any process is using the computer. Okay, like I said before, one of the ways you might access the operating system is through the user interface. You might also be accessing the operating system through application program interfaces. This is when you're writing a program. Anything that you do in your program or in system programs or anything that you do in the GUI or other user interfaces all eventually gets translated into system calls. These system calls um, are what, how you get from the application layer in the operating system down to the actual kernel calls um, in the operating system. The programs that use these system calls, like I said, are application programs, which you're familiar with, but there are also system programs, which you might think of as utilities. These are the programs that do the file management, uh, collect the status information, do the file modification, um, provide programming language support like compilers and so forth. Um, so so there are different levels of or different types of programs running on the system. Application programs, a lot, some of them come with the operating system. Some of them you buy separately. System programs always come with the operating system, and they're usually concerned with doing some of the operating system tasks. So I just wanted to make sure I covered that. Are there any questions on that? Just um, reply if you do have a question. If you don't, I'll just continue on. Okay, now I'd like to get through some of the materials for this week. Um, this week you're going to learn about processes, how they're created, how they're scheduled, how they terminate how processes communicate, either through shared memory or message passing. We'll talk about what threads are. In your book, you'll see a lot of detailed information on the APIs, the application program interface for threads. 
uh, whether it's pthreads, windows, or the Java thread library. And then there, there's going to be uh, some discussion on implicit threading versus explicit threading. Okay, I don't know, I won't be able to get through all this you know, in these slides, but all of this is in your textbook and hopefully you all have access to a textbook at this time. Okay, so what is a process? A process is a program in execution. If you think about it, a program is something that is passive. It's sitting out in a file, it's not doing anything. Once that program is loaded into memory, then it becomes a process. The process is something that is active. It's something that's running in memory. It has a program counter that's keeping track of the next instruction to execute. It has allocated resources and, and so forth. When you think about it, if you've written programs like a Java program, you, you've created your program and it sits out on disk. In order for that program to run, it has to be loaded into memory and it has to begin executing. And we talked a little bit about program execution um, last class with the program counter and, and so forth. Um, but it's important to distinguish between a program and a process, even though we kind of use the words interchangeably. Just remember, one, when a program's just out on disk, it's not doing anything. It must be in memory in order to execute. In addition to the code, which is off, often called the text section, what's loaded in memory is the stack, and this contains temporary data like function parameters, return addresses, and local variables. There's a data section, and the data section will be your global variables in your programs, and the heap. The heap is the memory that's being dynamically allocated as your program executes. Okay? So, so all this is your process. It's the code, the data, the registers, all of these things. It's important to understand what happens with processes in the operating system. This diagram discusses the process state. When a program is ready to run, it's considered to be a new state. The process has just been created. Okay? When a process is created, it may not have everything allocated to it and so forth. Once that happens, the process changes state and it's considered to be ready. Here the process is in memory, but it hasn't been assigned to the CPU. It hasn't been assigned to a, the processor. Once it's assigned to a processor, it moves to the running state. This is when the instructions are actually being executed. Sometimes when the program is being executed, it has to wait for something. It has to read something from, from the disk or write something to a file. When it's waiting for something, it goes into a state called the waiting state. It's waiting for some event to occur. Eventually, that event will occur and the process will go back to the ready state because it's now ready to be um, assigned to the CPU again. Okay, so it's going to go around and around with interrupts, with, with I.O. and so forth, going from the running state to the ready state. Also, we realize that sometimes the computer's in the running, I mean, the process is in the running state and it gets interrupted. Okay, remember we talked about interrupts last, last week. And in this case, when a process gets interrupted, it goes back from the running state back to the ready state because the CPU has to process that interrupt. And then eventually it's scheduled again and goes back into the running state. Eventually, it goes to a terminated state when the process has finished execution.
An important way the operating system does all this is by using something called the process control block. You'll also hear this called the task control block, the task structure, the process descriptor. It has a number of different names, but basically it's all the information that's associated with a process. It'll have things like the process state, and that's what we talked about on the previous slide. This is where the process is waiting or running or, or whatever. It will have the process number, okay, or the process identifier. This is how the process is identified to the operating system. It will have things like a program counter. Remember, the program counter is what's keeping track of what the next instruction is that should execute in this process. Because remember, while the process is executing in memory, the program counter is increasing as it goes from instruction to instruction. If the process has to go from the running state back to the ready state or the waiting state, somehow the CPU needs to know where it should start executing this program again, and that's what the program counter is used for. There are registers associated with each process, and, and we talked about registers and how they're very fast storage that the, the um, processes use. Um, there's other things like memory management information. Uh, what are the limits? How much memory can this, this process use? Um, there's also other resource information. Okay, what uh, files, for example, are, are the is this process using? And, and there's lots of other things. It's not all listed here, everything that could possibly in, be in a process control block, but there might be accounting information, like how much of the CPU is used, um, how much time has passed since this process started. There could be what IO devices does this process have control of. Um, you know, all different things like that. Anything that the, the system needs to keep track of for a process is stored in the process control block. And again, this process control block is very, very important when the process does what is called a context switch. So if you remember, we talked about how processes can be running, they can be ready, they can be waiting. Um, an interrupt can happen or I.O. Um, can be needed and the process gets moved out of, out of the running state into the waiting state or the ready state. And in order for the CPU to do this or the operating system to do this, it has to do a context switch. So if we look at this, let's assume that process zero is executing. Then an interrupt happens. When an interrupt happens, the process that was executing, P0, has to stop. Because the interrupt will cause the CPU to stop running the current task and handle that interrupt. So the CPU is going to save the state of process 0. So it'll save the process control block for that process so it can go and do what it needs to do to process the interrupt or to process the system call, whatever happened that, that is going to cause the CPU to stop executing process zero. Then the CPU will reload the state from another process or the same process depending, but let's, let's assume that it's loading process one. This could be a process that's going to help it handle the interrupt. It could be the process of the um, code that is called when you're doing a system call. Whatever the op operating system needs to do, it will then load the process control block from process one so that process one can start executing. We, if process one had been um, in memory already, it had been sitting there idle, and then 
after process zero was interrupted for whatever reason, process two gets to start executing once its state is reloaded from the process control block. It knows where to start executing process one because remember, it's keeping that program counter for process one in its process control block. Process one will continue executing until it gets, the operating system gets another interrupt or a system call. When this happens, it's going to save the state of process one's process control block, possibly load other processes, but eventually it may go back to reloading the state from process zero. And it'll go through the same thing over and over and over continuously as it processes, interrupts, or system calls and has to load different processes in memory. So this could be something where uh, process zero was doing something. It needed to uh, read something from disk. The actual process that handles reading from disk is process one, so process zero would stop executing, execution would transfer to process zero, I mean process one, I'm sorry, when process one was done, the execution would then transfer back to process zero. And this is how the operating system does what is called a context switch. Are there any questions on that? Okay, there's a question. Just to clarify in the process state, will it transfer from running to waiting, then to ready after that? Sometimes it will go from running to waiting, depending on, for instance, if the process is waiting for I.O or for something else to happen, it will go from the ready, from the running state to the waiting state. And if the process is then um, no longer waiting, in other words, whatever had to happen that that process was waiting for, once that happens, the process that was waiting will go into the ready state. In other cases, a process could be in running state the, the operating system gets an interrupt having nothing to do with that process, and so that process immediately will be moved from the um, running state to the ready state. Does that answer your question? It's going to, there are a lot of dis different states and the operating system is, is swapping these things out. We have all these different queues that are being used. Um, as things move between the different states. Um, and so sometimes it's going to go from running to waiting, sometimes it's going to go from running to ready, and then sometimes it goes from waiting to ready. Hala has a question, is the interruption because of an error or sometimes because of the priority of other processes? Um, yes, <laughs> is, your, is the answer, Hala. Um, an interrupt the processes will be interrupted for a number of different reasons and they're interrupted all the time. It happens constantly and that's why it's important for the context switch to be very fast. You don't want the user to even realize that their process was interrupted. So you want this context switching to happen very, very quickly. Um, so, so as Hala said, the interruption sometimes can because, be because of an error, but it could be because some other process um, has finished what it's doing and, and you know, in, is interrupting the system. It could be, be because um, a device it has, was been, has been waiting or um, a device has been working to uh, get data from the disk or from the keyboard or whatever and it just got some data so it interrupts the the, the uh, CPU. Okay, so, so just about any time anything happens in the operating system, these interruptions are going to be occurring. So they're occurring all the time and there's lots and lots and lots of them happening. 
at all times. So be aware that the context switch time is overhead. The system isn't doing anything useful while it's switching. And so the more complicated the operating system is and the process control block is, the longer it's going to take it to switch contexts between uh, two different processes. But if you've ever looked at, uh, like on a Windows system, looked at the processes that are running, um, you'll see which ones are, are using CPU time, or you might, and and you because you can see the numbers changing, or see which ones are using memory, and they change very quickly as all these different processors processes keep getting access to the processor through these interruptions. Does that answer your question, Hala? Okay. Amjad, um, uh, you were trying to enter the, enter the class. Um, for what you've missed, you can watch the recording and just let me know that you've watched it and let me know if you have any questions um, and, and you'll get credit for attending this session. Okay, so I hope the context switch is clear to you because that's actually your first exercise. Exercise 3.2. Describe the actions taken by the kernel to do a context switch between processes. OK, so, so you should have a clear idea. You can read it more about it in your book. And then you should be able to answer this question. OK, one of the things that we touched on a little bit in, in describing the processes is queuing. Remember I said things are waiting. They're waiting to move to the CPU, they're waiting for I.O. to happen. Um, you know, all kinds of things are happening in the operating system where, where a process is, you know, waiting for something to happen. The way the CPU or the way the operating system manages this is using queues. And in, in last week's reading, you read about what a queue is. And what you need to know is that things are sitting in queues until some kind of scheduler actually will remove that process from the queue. So there's an, I, there's an, an OS scheduler that's you know not really shown here, but but um, the OS has a job scheduler, which selects what jobs are going to 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 be you know loaded into the system. This is mostly when you have batch jobs. The job scheduler is is often called a long term scheduler. Then you have a CPU scheduler. The CPU scheduler is what takes things from the ready queue and gives them access to the CPU. You also have things like an I.O. scheduler. An I.O. scheduler is what's going to take things from the I.O. queue <clears throat> and give, it, give um, that process access to the input-output device and so forth. So there's lots of different schedulers in the system. And what you want to do is try to, or what you want to do if you're the operating system, is try to make sure that you have a mix of jobs that are waiting for CPU and waiting for I.O. Because remember that only one process, it can be accessing the CPU at a time. So you're hoping that some of your processes are going to be waiting for I.O., waiting to, to read things from disk or waiting for a keystroke from the keyboard or whatever, because while they're waiting, another process can get that CPU. So we have a job queue that's of all the processes in the system. We have a ready queue that's the set of all processes in main memory ready and waiting to execute. And then we have device queues, which are a set of processes that are waiting for the different devices. And processes are going to move around between these different queues. 
Okay. Any questions on that? Okay, so we have these processes, and how do they get created? Processes are, are created, and they're running, and they're deleted. Okay, so we have those different things happening with processes. These pictures are in the, your book, so if they're not showing up very clearly to you, you can see them in your book. But think about it, when you boot the operating system, originally there's just going to be one process running. And a lot, of, a lot of operating systems call that the init process. What happens when the init process is running is, is it gets everything going. And once things are to a certain state, other processes can begin running. So here we have the init process. It might kick off a, a, a shell process a threads process, it might kick off a login process to let someone log into the system. And think about it, if you boot your system and you have the login set on your system, a lot of times your system boots and the next thing you see on your screen is something for, it, for you to log in. So, so what happens is that init process starts creating other processes within the operating system. Now, a pro any process that's created can start creating other processes. So for instance, the login process might create some additional processes. And then those processes can even create more processes. So you end up with this whole tree of processes. And this is how, when you, when you look at all the processes were, that are running, this is how they all start running. There had to be one process in the beginning, and then more each process started creating other processes that it needed. <clears throat> in some cases, the parent, in this case, init would be a parent of login, kthread, and, and the shell. This, the parent may run concurrently with their children. And in this case, init has three children. Or the parent process can, can wait for the children to end before it continues to run again. OK? Now, a child process can have children of its own. OK? So here, kthread is a child of the init thread, but it's the parent of the k helper thread. So processes can be both parents and children, just like you can be a parent and you're also a child. Okay, it works the same way. <clears throat> One of the ways processes are created is by using something called a fork. Okay, the fork is, what the fork does is create a process. So after the fork is executed, we have a parent process and a child process. The parent and the child can be executing concurrently. The parent can be doing things while the child is doing things, or the parent might wait for the child to end. So this diagram pretty much shows a parent waiting. The parent forks off or creates a child. The child starts executing. In the meantime, the parent is waiting. Once the parent is done waiting, in other words, the child has ex exited, it's, it's done with its work, the parent can then resume. OK? So sometimes parents wait for their children to finish. Sometimes they don't. Um, if, if you end up with a child that doesn't have any parent waiting for it, then that um, process um, can, it is considered to be a zombie. OK, it's called a zombie. If the parent itself has terminated, OK, not that the parent forgot to wait for it, but if the parent has terminated, then the processes, the child processes, are orphans. 
Okay, Hala asks, if a, a parent has been interrupted, will it affect the child or are they working independently? The parent process and the child process are two separate processes. Remember, only one of them will be in, it will have control of the CPU at any one time. Okay, so unless you're on a system that has multiple CPUs, the parent process and the child process are independent. Okay, they're two different processes. When the parent is waiting for the child, however, then they're, they're not as independent because then the parent's going to be sitting there. They're actually be sitting in a waiting queue because they're waiting for something to happen. And once this um, child eg exits, then the event that the parent was waiting for will have happened and then the parent will be moved from the waiting queue to the ready queue and eventually will be running again. Okay, so remember, Hala, that only one of them can be interrupted because only one of them has access to the CPU at a time. Okay, you have to, and, and remember, what we're talking about here is process creation, so each of these are separate processes um, in, this, in the system. So here's some code that, that's written in C um, that, explain, that shows how a process creation works. Here we're looking, let's assume that this is the parent process and eventually the, the parent process might need to create a child process so it calls the fork call, okay? The fork is what will create a child process. When the fork call is executed, we now have two processes in memory that are exactly the same. One is the parent process that looks like what you see on the screen here, and the other is the child process that also looks like what you see on the screen. But remember, when the parent creates the child process, it's, it's creating a duplicate of itself. The operating system is creating a duplicate process control block, um, but you know, changing some things like the identifier and, and so forth because it is a different process in memory. But both of the, the parent child and the, and the both, both the parent process and the child process have this code executing. So when the parent continues to execute after the fork happens, it will continue with that statement, checking to see if the process ID is less than zero. When the process ID is less than zero, it means it wasn't able to create the child's process and so it failed and the parent process in this case is going to end. If the process identifier that was returned to the parent is something other, is something, um, equal to zero, it's a value equal to zero, that means that the, the child process is executing. Now, if it's less than zero, an error occurred. If the process identifier is equal to zero, that means that this is the child process. Okay, the parent process doesn't get back the child's uh, process identifier. The child gets back its process identifier. So the child process now will be executing. Okay, and it will ex when it executes, it does an exec. The exec actually loads new code into memory. The exec call is how new code gets loaded uh, to, into the process, and in this case, the code that, that's being loaded is the ls command, and um, that's something that, that does a directory listing in a Unix system, okay? So if it's the, if it's the parent process, the parent does the fork, okay? If the parent does the fork, it 
didn't, and it didn't have an error, it succeeded, it won't be the child process, it will be the parent process. The parent can wait for the child to complete. The child process after the fork is initially looking at the same code, but eventually when it realizes, oh, I'm the child, it then executes whatever code the child is supposed to execute. So even though the two processes start out to be exactly the same, the exec can change what the child process does. Okay, and this is just a very simple example. You could want the um, parent and the child to do the exact same thing in the code, or you could have the child process change what it does by executing the exec. So pretty much the parent does the fork, the child starts executing at this point. In this case, the child does an exec. The parent, when it did the fork, after it does the fork, it comes back, and as long as there wasn't an error, it comes down here and waits for the child to complete. So you can see that we have two processes. They initially have the exact same code, but if the child process chooses to do an exec, new code will be, look, will be loaded for that child. This code will be wiped out completely, and the child will go off and do something else. The parent would still be waiting here for the child to complete its, its um, execution, for the child to complete the ls command. Okay, so that's kind of how, how the fork and exec works on a system. Oh my goodness, I just realized that we're out of time. Um, what I want to uh, point out to you is that what you're looking at here, if you understand this, is going to help you with the exercise 3.6. Okay, and that um, exercise is going to be doing a, a fork, and you're going to have to look at the code and, and do a little explanation for that. Um, we didn't get into nearly as much as I had hoped to. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to send you all my slides for this week, and I'm, I'm sorry we didn't get into all of it. And what, what I'll do is uh, send you everything, even the ones that we haven't, we haven't looked um, at. Um, a few ex last minute questions here. Um, Monora asked, do you have to explain it? Yes, you, you're going to explain, um, well, read the, read the question in your book, you're going to explain if and when the code, this line of code, printf line j, gets executed, okay? Explain what happens in the child or the parent that allows this line of code to be executed. Arwa said, can I upload these slides? Yes, I will, I will email you um, these slides, including the ones that we didn't get to, and if you have any question about them, um, email me. Hala asked, is code required in this course? Yes, in fact, starting in week four, you will have some programming assignments, and I will be sending you something. Um, if you don't have Java, for example, I will send you some information on how to um, load the Java virtual machine, okay? If you don't, if you don't know any programming languages, um, I was told that you you should have some programming background. You will have programming assignments in this course. If you look through, I think in week four, week six, and week eight, there are some programming assignments. Okay, um, I won't keep you any longer. Um, I think what I'm going to do though is I'm going to continue recording. Even though I know you have to leave, feel free to leave the session. I'm going to keep recording, and I'm going to talk through the rest of my slides so you can come back and listen to this recording um, if you need to leave now to do something else. Okay? Does everybody understand?
Okay. So I'm going to continue talking. Um, like I was saying, the exercise that you're going to have is going to look have, be code that looks very similar to the code you see here. But in, this, in the code that you're seeing in the exercise, there's going to be one line of code. And you're going to have to figure out if the parent pro process is going to execute that code, or if the child process is going to execute that line of code, or if neither process executes the line of code. So, so tell me what you think happens and explain why. So that's, that's one of your exercises for this week. OK, the next thing that um, we need to talk a little bit about is inter-process communication, which is called IPC. Remember that we just talked about how we can have all these different processes in memory. Sometimes these processes need to communicate. They may be independent processes, which I think Hala was asking about. Um, Mona said you have a class now, Monara. Yes, please leave if you have to. What I said is I'm going, to, I'm going to keep talking. Feel free to leave. I'm recording this. You can come back uh, for the recording. Don't worry about leaving. It's not rude. I'm, I'm sorry I kept you late. OK? But what I'll do in the future is when we get to the end of the class time, if I'm not done, I'll keep talking. You can leave whenever you have to, and you can access the recording. OK, because I want to make sure I talk about some of these things, because I think it helps you to hear it as well as read it. OK, so, so we're going to be talking about inner process communication a little bit. Um, I think it was Hala who asked something about um, processes being interrupted and so forth. And, and part of what she was asking is, are the processes independent, or are they still linked somehow? Sometimes processes are independent, which means that um, they're not the, they don't need anything from another process. So we might have lots of different processes in memory, and you know the process from the application that I'm running should be independent from the process that an application you're running has has invoked. But sometimes processes need to communicate. They're dependent on one another. They cooperate with one another. <clears throat> so cooperating processes can be affected by other processes and can affect other processes. And they can affect other processes by sharing some of, some of their data. And there's two ways they can do this. They can share data by using shared memory. And with shared memory, both the processes share a region of memory and code. And to access that, the application programmers have to write certain code where, let's say in this case, process A might be writing to the shared memory so that process B can read from it. So the applications need to coordinate and cooperate. And they do this through the shared memory. So process A may have some data it wants to share with process B. It would put it in the shared memory. Process B, when it needs the data, would go to that shared memory and read it out back out. So, so the applications need to know that this shared memory exists and need to know what it can access in that shared memory. Another way processes communicate is through message passing. And this is the, an example of message passing. Again, these two processes are on the same system, but sometimes these, these two processes need to talk to one another. So what they do is they use a message queue. Process A can send a message and that message will be put into a message queue. And it can say, this is a message for process B, and here's some data that process B needs. Process B, on the other hand, may be listening or waiting for a message, and it can get that message that, that process A sent from the message queue. 
So there's going to be small amounts of data in each message, and they'll pass these messages to one another through the message queue. So one will be sending messages, the other one will be receiving messages. Okay, and, and these two things happen only when both of the processes are in the same memory space, on the same computer, using the same uh, CPU. Okay, so we can share memory or we can pass messages. Message queue is just another queue that's in the system um, where different messages are stored and the different processes can get to those messages. Okay, any questions on what inner process communication is? Okay. All right. Your book goes into quite a bit of detail on communications in client server systems, and I'm going to touch on them briefly because we use client server kind of systems all the time. This is the way uh, lots of systems communicate between two different computer systems, like when you're accessing something on the web. You're going to a web server um, to, to get information, or your browser is going to the web server to get information and then displaying it to you. Um, there, there are lots of different uh, reasons why different computers communicate, and they have a number of ways to do that communication. One way is using sockets. Sockets are defined as an endpoint for communication. So there'll be a socket on the server and a socket on the client. These pa this pair of sockets are connected, and that's how a client system can talk to a server system and vice versa. They get this connection through sockets. It's kind of if you think about you know, a, a, a telephone. You might be holding your telephone up to your ear. That's your socket. And the server, whoever you're talking to, might have a telephone up to its ear, and that's its socket. And you talk using that telephone connection. OK? Another way that clients and servers talk to one another are through remote procedure calls. Remote procedure call is like calling a process on your own computer, but it's set up in a way that the actual call is being executed on another computer. OK? So, so again, here, what we're doing is we're using ports on the computer system. And if the client system says, I want to execute this procedure, if that procedure doesn't exist on the, the current uh, computer, the client might be using a remote procedure call to say, I want to do this, but I can't do it on my system. I have to do it over on the server. So it will call a pro procedure over on the server, and the procedure, the server process will execute that procedure on behalf of the client. Another way clients and servers communicate is using pipes. Pipes, again, are a conduit that allow two processes to communicate, and it's treated almost like files. You can open a pipe. You can uh, read from a pipe. You can write to a pipe. You can close a pipe, just like you do a file. But if you think about what a, a pipe is, you know, a pipe that your water runs through, in other words, um, think of it as if you have one end of the pipe, and you can you know, put something into that pipe by writing to the pipe. On the other end, someone can be pulling something out of that pipe by reading from that pipe. OK, they're kind of um, limited. Pipes are kind of limited in what they can do. They're not as versatile as sockets or remote procedure calls, but they are a way that clients and servers can communicate. Another thing that your book mentions is remote method invocation. This is pretty much the Java equivalent of a remote procedure call. It's how you do a remote procedure call in Java. So we have processes running on the same system, and then they can communicate between using shared memory and message passing. And then we have 
processes running on different systems, and they communicate using sockets, remote procedure calls, pipes, and remote methods. OK. So, so all of that um, was covered in chapter three of your book. Are there any questions at this time? OK, if there are no questions, I do want to go on to threads. And again, if you have to leave, that's fine. I'm recording this so that everyone can, can um, listen to the recording and watch the recording if they have other things to do, because I know we're going way over time. OK, Aida, you, you're sad that there's more information? <laughs> you thought we were done? Is that what you're saying? Um, there is a lot of information in these chapters. And, and I'm only touching on some of the high points. There is much, much more detail in the chapter. Operating systems are very complex. And I think you're starting to get more and more of a sense of that as we go through the materials. OK, so a thread is a flow of control within a process. OK, a thread is not a process. It's just control within a process. For instance, you might have a browser, um, and the browser is doing things like displaying images or text on your screen, but it's also retrieving things from the server. So your browser may have multiple threads of control within that process. Not asked, will we be uh, reading all the chapters this semester? We will be reading most of them. If you look um, at the student manual that's out in Blackboard, you will see that we will, we will be reading most of the chapters in the book, except for um, some of the chapters at the end. So there's a lot of information in this course. Uh, to get back to threads, so a multi-threaded program has multiple threads within a single process or application. The different tasks within an application can be handled by the different threads, like I mentioned with a browser. You would use threads because creating a thread is very lightweight. You don't have to do a lot uh, to create a thread, whereas remember when we were talking about process creation, process creation is fairly heavyweight, meaning that it takes a lot of processor time to create a new um, process control block and, and so forth when you're, when you're creating new processes. So to give you a picture of what threads look like, this is a single threaded process. A single threaded process is what you have when your application is pretty much only doing one thing. There is one thread of control, one, one um, thread that's being executed. That thread has access to the code, the data, the files um, for that process. It also has uh, the registers and the stack that are, are being used as it's executing. In a multi-threaded process, all the threads share the code, the data, and the files, but they have their own registers and stack because the different threads can be doing different things. So they need to keep, you know, push things on the stack and pop things on the stack and use data in their own registers. Um, they, they may not be sharing the registers and the stack. But notice that it's still one process. So when you look at a multi-threaded program on your system, you will only see one process out there because the threads aren't different processes. They are different parts of that program that may be executing at different times. But they're still just one process when you look at it from the view of the operating system. OK? There are user threads and there are kernel threads. User threads are what you would be creating if you were writing in Java or C or C++. Kernel threads are what the kernel executes. Remember that there's kind of this user mode and kernel mode. 
So there are two different levels of threads in the system. The threads that you'll be using will be POSIX, POSIX threads, um, which you usually um, doing those if you're writing in C or C++. Win32 threads, again, you might be using these if you're running a Windows system and writing code in C or C++. And then Java threads. And those are on any system if you're running Java and creating threads in your application that you're writing. Kernel threads, all operating systems support the kernel threads. And there's a mapping, oh, let me go here. There's a mapping of the user threads to the kernel threads. Some, some systems will map many user threads to one kernel thread. And you can see that this would cause a, a bottleneck in your system because the kernel only has one thread running. And so all the user threads have to be mapped when you go down to kernel mode to that one kernel thread. Many of the operating systems we use today have a one-to-one -one mapping, where whenever the user creates a thread, there will be a, a corresponding kernel thread that will handle the kernel functions for any of these, for its particular user thread. So that's a one-to-one -one mapping where we can have multiple user threads, and they're mapped one-to-one -to, -one to corresponding kernel threads. You can also have a system where it maps many user threads to many kernel threads, but there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. The reason we would do the multi-threaded programming is that it will make our system more responsive, OK? Because what will happen is a process might be blocked waiting for I.O., but the uh, truth of the matter is it may just be one thread in that process that's blocked. So rather than block the entire uh, process and make that whole process wait, the um, operating system will keep track of, oh, well, this process is doing something, but only one of its threads is waiting for I.O. The other threads, for example, can continue executing. So it may not have to give up the CPU. So now you can see that the operating system, when you're talking about threads, has an even more difficult task. It's not just do we schedule a, a process or not schedule a process. If we have threads, the CPU, the operating system, has to determine whether any of those threads are using certain resources, whether any of those threads are waiting, because they're, they're all in a single process in a multi-threaded application. OK, so you can see our operating system concepts are getting more and more complicated because of all the different things that the operating system needs to do. But there are benefits to doing multi-programming. It lets the uh, system be more responsive because different threads can be executing. Um, it's not like the whole process has to be stopped because one thread is stopped. Different threads, other, uh, um, unlike processes, can share resources very easily. Remember when I showed you the diagram of a multi-threaded program, the different threads were sharing their code, their data, their files. OK, so that's easier than doing shared memory or message passing. I also mentioned that thread creation is cheaper than process creation. In other words, it takes less time. It takes less work to create a new thread. And also, to switch between threads is lower than switching between processes. OK, context switching, as we talked about before, is processing. Switching processes. Thread switching, you're just switching between um, threads of execution within a single process. So it's much, much faster. And then there's scalability. Um, processes can take advantage of multi-processor architectures because threads actually can be run on different processors at the same time. OK? So if, if you have uh, something where your CPU has multiple cores, you can actually 
the, the operating system can actually be set up so that different threads run on different cores in the system. Whoops. Um, the way we're going to interact with threads if we're writing code is through the thread libraries. There are two common thread libraries that are used. First is the POSIX, the P thread library. And this API is usually used in C or C++ to manage threads. Again, remember that the API is how you're going to be accessing the actual implementation of threads in the operating system. OK, so you're going to be using kind of a, a simpler API to call things to create threads and to manage the threads that you're using in your application. Um, and the API looks the same whether you're on an, uh, a Unix system or a Sun system or a um, Apple system. If you're using the P threads, the API will look the same on all of these systems, even though the implementation on, on the threads might be very different in the operating system itself. Java threads, the Java API works kind of the same way in that the threads are managed, in this case, by the JVM instead of the operating system. Because if you remember, if you know Java, Java runs in a Java virtual machine, which runs on top of the operating system. So you're going to be calling the Java API to, to do things with threads. The Java virtual machine will manage those threads. And the way it does that is it, it uses the threads provided by the underlying operating system. So there's an extra layer when you're talking about threads. So, so one of the things that if you're doing the optional discussion, you're going to be, be talking about and looking at how threads are different than processes. And one of your homework assignments is exercise 4.16. In exercise 4.16, it says Linux does not distinguish between processes and threads. So even though Linux has a thread library, a thread API, the way the operating system implements processes and threads is the same. Underneath the covers, if you're looking down in the operating system, processes and threads are the same in Linux. So Linux treats both. Um, threads and processes the same way inside the operating system. And it allows the thread to act like a process or act like a thread depending on some flags that you set when you call the clone system call, which is how you create a cloned process in Linux. Now, in Windows or Solaris or actually most other operating systems, processes and threads are different. They're, they're not um, separate, pro threads are not separate processes like they are in Linux. They actually are part of the process that created them. So when you have uh, an operating system like XP or Solaris, there's the data structure for the process, which we've been calling the PCB, will have pointers to the separate threads belonging to that process. Your assignment is co to contrast these two approaches for modeling processes and threads within the kernel. In other words, um, what are like, the advantages or disadvantages with making a thread be a process? And what are the advantages or disadvantages of making processes be different than threads within the kernel? And I'm, giving, I'm going to give you some things to think about. This is kind of a hard question, OK? You're going to have to really think about processes and threads and how they're scheduled and what the operating system has to do to schedule them and how it moves things between the queues and all these things that we've talked about. So some things to think about. 
Linux implements threads as standard processes that share resources with other processes. So in Linux, they're still sharing things um, between threads. But in Linux, each thread has its own process control block. Actually, in Linux, they call them um, task structures, because Linux calls processes tasks. So each, has, each thread has its own task structure or process control block. So when you look at a system that's a Linux system, if you created four threads, you're going to see four processes in Linux, the original thread and then the three threads that were created. In other operating systems, the system implements threads within a single process. So in, in the case where you might be um, having an original process and then creating three threads, you'll have a total of four threads running, but that one process control block is going to be pointing to those different threads, but the operating system is only managing that one process. And if it needs to know about the threads, it has to actually go into that process control block and look at what each thread is doing. So that's kind of what I want you to think about in this question. Think about how the different ways of implementing a thread might affect some of the tasks that the kernel must perform. In other words, if the uh, operating system needs to schedule something, will it schedule things differently? Is it more uh, more difficult for it to schedule things if if we have the Linux implementation where each process is is a thread and each thread is a process, or it will, will it be more difficult to schedule things if one process can have multiple things running inside of it? Okay, same thing with resource management. Is that going to be more difficult? Think about how. Um, all the different services that the operating system provides, how will that be different whether the process has threads inside it or whether a thread is a separate process? Okay? So, so you're kind of going to be thinking about um, whether having threads be a process makes things in the operating system simpler or does it make it harder? And look at some of the different services that the operating system provides and try to explain to me whether you think having a process and a thread be the same thing makes it easier, or whether having a process with multiple threads makes it easier or harder, depending. OK, so that's really what you, the question for exercise 4.16 is asking. It's asking you to understand threads and processes and how they differ, and you'll be talking about that in on the discussion board if you choose to participate, and then think about the tasks that the operating system has to, has to do in the kernel and what things are easier for the kernel to do in Linux and what things are easier for the kernel to do in the other operating systems. Or conversely, what things are easier or what things are harder for the, for the operating system to do in Linux and what things are harder for it to do in the other operating systems. Okay, so I, I'm trying to give you some ideas of some of the things to think about and talk about as you answer this question. Okay, I'm sorry we've gone you know a half hour over our time and I, I thank those of you who were able to stay and if you weren't able to stay, I totally understand. Um, I would prefer to get through all the material that I'd like to get through, even if you have to leave. Um, maybe I talk too much, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, I'll try not to take up, up too much of your time. And if you have to leave, you can always go back and look at the recordings. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Um, otherwise, send me emails. Add questions to the question and answer discussion board for week two. Um, you know, contact me in, in any way you're comfortable if you do have any questions on any of this or questions about the assignments, and I'll answer them as best I can. Okay, so if there are no questions for now, um, I'd like to thank all of you for attending and 
I'll be talking to you next week.